So last time we had been talking about addition of angular momentum. And if you do that for two generic angular momenta, J1 and J2, then the total angular momenta that you get out can be any one of J1 plus J2 as a maximum. And then going down by steps of one until you get to the difference in absolute value between the two angular momenta. And so one thing you can do is count states. So first of all, these are the um, product states. That's why it looks like a little circle with a multiplication sign. And if we count them, there are two J1 plus one states times two J2 plus one states. Because each one of those you get by adding up the different M sub ones and M sub twos you can have. And each one of these numbers represents a total angular momentum. Okay, and so if we count those, the J1 plus J2 state has how many states in it? It has two J1 plus two J2 plus one. And J1 plus J2 minus one has two J1 plus two J2 minus one. And then when you get to the last one, it's two times absolute value J1 minus J2 plus one. And if you add those all up, then you indeed get this product of two J1 times two J2 plus one. Okay, so when, we, when I was mentioning last time about the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients and the fact that you can compute them by applying the J minus operator together with orthonormality, that's how you actually construct the states. But if you just want to know how many there are and enumerate them, then that's where this way of writing things comes in. And then you have to just remember what the degeneracy, what the degeneracy of each one of these states is. The degeneracy comes from the M, the magnetic quantum numbers. Okay, and now another thing to remember, and this will be relevant for your homework, is the fact that you can add angular momenta sequentially, and we will do that several times in this course. For example, when we talk about the fine and hyperfine structure of the hydrogen atom. And so all that means is if you really want the total angular momenta of several different angular momenta, you just, for example, can add J1 and J2 and then add that to J3. Okay, the little circle with the cross sign again means that what we're doing there is we're constructing the product states in terms of the total angular momentum states. Or you could do it like this. You could do it as J1 combined with J3 and then combine that with J2. Or you can do it by J2 and J3 being combined and then combine that with J1. And of course you have to get the same answer in the end, no matter how you do it. So for example, let's do, let's do an example of how many states are there that are two P states of hydrogen. Okay, and along with that, we're gonna ask, uh, what are their total angular momenta and degeneracies? Now, when we do this, we're gonna take into account something we haven't, uh, one thing we've sort of mentioned and one thing we totally haven't mentioned. 
and that's the electron spin and the proton spin. The electron spin turns out to be important for the fine structure of the hydrogen atom and the proton spin for the hyperfine structure of the hydrogen atom. Okay, but from the, po from the point of view of today, all we're worried about is, is enumerating the total angular momentum states. Later on, we'll worry about what their energies are. Okay, so in this case, 2p, by the way, the two means the principal quantum number is two, and the p is code that's telling you the orbital angular momentum is one. And so if we make a list of the angular momenta in this problem, there's the electron spin, the orbital angular momentum, and the proton spin, and I'm gonna put them in that order. Okay, and so for the combination of the first two, the electron spin, of course, has angular momentum one half. And in this case, the orbital angular momentum is one. Okay, and then we're gonna combine the result with the proton spin angular momentum, which is also one half. Okay, so that we, we first combine the first two, that's gonna give us a one half plus a three halves. Okay, and that combination we're gonna call J. So J is equal to the electron spin plus the orbital. And then we combine that with the proton spin. So we just take this and distribute, we get a one half cross one half. And we add to that a three halves cross one half. And the rules for orbital for combining the one half cross one half is we get a zero and a one. And for three halves cross one half, we get a one and a two. So what those numbers represent, the zero, one, and the other one and the two are the F angular momenta. So I'm defining F to be J plus the proton spin, or another way of saying it is it's just the total of all three angular momenta. Okay, so F is, I don't know why F is chosen for the total angular momentum of the whole system, but that's just the letter we're gonna choose. Okay, and so, that this is telling us that the F quantum numbers, if we measure, for example, F squared, that has eigenvalues that are H bar squared, little f times little f plus one, and little f can be zero, one, another copy of one, and two. Okay, so the degeneracies of the possible measurements of F squared are for F equals zero, the degeneracy is one. For F equals one, the degeneracy is six. And the reason it's six is because you have two copies of them, each one of them gives you a degeneracy three. And so, m sub f is minus one, zero, and plus one, but twice, because you have two copies of it. Okay, and then lastly, you have f equals two, which has degeneracy five, right? It's two times two plus one. And so if we add up all the states that we're getting this way, it's one plus six plus five is 12. And that matches with the fact that if we had one half cross one cross one half, this has degeneracy two, this has degeneracy three, and this has degeneracy three, two. So that's 12 total because we just multiply them together in the product basis. So either way, there are 12 different states for the 2p level of hydrogen, 
Uh, before, we would have just said there were three such states, but that was because when we originally did the hydrogen atom, we were ignoring the spins. And now, later on in this course, when we do, as I said, the fine and the hyperfine structure, we're going to want to take into account, or we're forced to take into account, those spins. And so when we count up states and figure out how much they're shifted in energy by the spin effects, um, this counting will be useful. OK, questions on that? OK, so that's, uh, that was a, of course, very lightning and incomplete review of some of the things we talked about in, um, in uh, Physics 660. But now it's time to move on to new stuff. And so our first new topic is going to be stationary state perturbation theory. Sorry, Patrick, state... you... Yes, go ahead. A little bit, could you scroll up? I was still writing that last part. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we're going to be talking about stationary state perturbation theory. Stationary state perturbation theory is sometimes called time independent. We will later be talking about time dependent perturbation theory. Okay, but for now, stationary state is an independent, is a synonym for time independent. And so here's the general problem we want to solve is given a Hamiltonian, which doesn't depend on time, we want to solve the eigenvalue equation. for the Hamiltonian. If it doesn't depend on time, then solving this will tell us two things. First of all, it will tell us the energy levels of the system. And secondly, if you know the energy eigenstates and eigenvalues, then you can evolve any state in time, not just the energy eigenstates, because you can write anything as a linear combination of these eigenstates, psi sub n, and you know that each one of them involves, when you time evolve it, involves an exponential e to the minus the energy times time divided by h bar. And so you know how each, each eigenstate evolves in time, and then you, therefore you can involve any state you want in time. So that's why we want to solve the problem. Uh, the problem, the difficulty is that not every problem can be solved in a reasonable way. And so let's suppose, though, that the problem that we have to solve has the following structure, that the Hamiltonian is equal to something that we do know how to solve, and let's call that h0, plus something that's hopefully not too big. So I'm going to write lambda, and I'm going to call the perturbation w. Some books call, call it v. Some books call it h sub 1. I don't like to call it h sub 1 because I want to minimize the number of subscripts. And I don't want to call it v because to me, v is a potential. And this thing isn't necessarily a potential. It could just be any, anything that we're adding on to the Hamiltonian. Um, but the, the idea here is h0 is something where we know how to solve the problem. I'll just write known there. Lambda is something that is supposed to be in some sense small. And W is the difficult part of the Hamiltonian. Okay, it may either be something that we don't know how to solve at all, or that we're, we can't solve it when it's appearing together with the H0 part. Okay, so if the problem has, and we'll have to worry later about how small is small enough. But let's say that we have this H0, and we're going to assume, of course, it's a big assumption, but we're going to assume that we have solved its eigenvalue problem. So that we have all of the states n such that H0 acting on n is equal to some energy. And to distinguish this energy from this energy up here, I'm going to call these energies curly E's. Okay. 
And so these are known. Both the energies and the states we're assuming are known. And we're going to call those the unperturbed states. Okay, and so notice I'm just using N as a label. This doesn't, it may look like a, for example, a harmonic oscillator, but it doesn't have to be. N is just some label that tells you which state you're talking about. And so the idea is these are the unperturbed states. Or the states of the unperturbed problem. And we're going to assume for now that they're not degenerate. Because you have to do something slightly different if they are degenerate, but we will get to that later. Okay, and so the idea is assuming that we know these and we know the solution to this problem, we want to construct the solutions to the bigger problem with the bigger Hamiltonian. Okay, and so the strategy of perturbation theory is to write the things we don't know, the unknowns, as a series in lambda. And so let's just go ahead and do that. We have the state psi sub n that we'd like to know. And we're going to say that it's a part that doesn't depend on lambda, which I'm going to call psi n zero. And then a term linear in lambda, psi n1. And then a term quadratic in lambda, which is going to be called psi n2, and so on. And then we're going to do the same thing with the energy. So the energy of the nth state is going to be a part that doesn't depend on lambda, plus a part linear in lambda plus a part quadratic in lambda. And usually that's as far as we really care about, but in principle, this goes on forever. Okay, and so we're making a big assumption when we say this, we're assuming that these unknowns that we're trying to solve for are smooth functions of lambda. Okay, and not only that, but we're gonna hope they converge. These series converge, which is not guaranteed. Okay, and we'll actually see uh, at least one famous case where they don't converge and that's called the Stark effect. It turns out the Stark effect, even though it doesn't converge, the answer you get is still extremely useful. All right, so that's the assumption. And now if we, if we stare at this, we realize that that means we've already got the parts independent of lambda, because if we just turn off lambda, then psi n zero is nothing other than the unperturbed state n. Okay, and the unperturbed energy is the thing e n zero is what we called curly e sub n. Okay, so really the, the thing we need to figure out first is the ones with superscript one. Okay, those are the first order corrections as you do this, do this perturbation theory in Lambda. Okay, so one thing I wanna mention and emphasize because it will come back to be a useful observation when we do treat the case of degeneracies is that when we say things are a smooth function of lambda, that really means, oops, that really means that for each unperturbed state, there is a unique perturbed state and vice versa. Okay, otherwise, if I couldn't assign a specific psi sub n to n, then I wouldn't be able to do this expansion here, right? This expansion is saying, I can always dial lambda to anything I want. I can make it small. 
uh, I can make it zero. But in any case, there's a, a specific n for each size sub n and vice versa. And that's what's going to cause us difficulty if we're not careful when we allow degeneracies in the energy eigenvalues. Okay, and we will come, I'll remind you of that later when we do the degenerate case. Okay, so in preparation for this problem, we want to make some important choices of uh, convention. So here's our first choice, which is going to look fairly natural and obvious. We can choose, maybe I should say we will choose, that our unperturbed states are orthonormal. So if I take any two of them, n prime and n, and I take their inner product, that's delta n n prime. That's just saying that they form an orthonormal basis. And we know we can do that because we had a theorem that says, or actually it was a definition that said, if you have a observable, which H0 is an observable, it's the Hamiltonian for the unperturbed system. If you have an observable, then you can always choose an orthonormal basis of its eigenvectors. And so we're just taking advantage of that here. So that's a choice that's fairly obvious. Here's one that's less obvious, but is super important. We will also choose, this is a con very convenient thing. It's not actually mandatory. But we're going to choose this, the following to be true, that if we take the inner product of an unperturbed state with the corresponding perturbed state, that we're going to require to be one. OK, and so this is true for each n. And so here we're really using this fact that for each n, for each n, there really is a corresponding psi sub n. And so for each n, you take the corresponding psi sub n, take their inner product, and we're going to require that to be 1. Notice this is not a chronic or delta. We're not saying that n with psi m, some other, some other perturbed state, has to be 0. And in fact, it won't be. OK, so it's, this is on purpose not a chronic or delta. OK, and that condition that we've assumed is a normalization condition for our unperturbed state, or for our perturbed states. For psi sub n. And so note that having made that choice, it's not true that they're orthonormal. So it's not true that the psi sub n are orthonormal. And in fact, once we get to it, we will compute psi n inner product with psi n, and we will find out it is not 1. But that's OK, because we know that once we compute it, we can always divide by its norm. And that will give us something that does have norm one. So we will renormalize it later. Okay, but it turns out we don't want to renormalize it until the very last step. Otherwise, it will cause all kinds of pro uh, trouble. Okay, so I want to draw a box around this because it's so important. So, what does that statement mean? We can rewrite it, the boxed formula, as inner product of n. I'm just going to write out what psi sub n is. OK, according to our assumption, it looks like this. It's an expansion in lambda. Oops. That should have been a 1. Okay, and this is psi n2, et cetera. Okay, and we're assuming all of that is one, but this right here is already one because psi n0 is n, and then we can use this orthonormality condition. So that's telling us that we have one plus lambda 
n psi n1 plus lambda squared n psi n2 plus et cetera equals one. Oops. Okay, and now I can cancel the ones. And that's telling me I have a sum of things with different powers of lambda, which has to add up to zero. And the only way that can happen for every lambda, so that we have a smooth function of lambda, is for each one of the terms to vanish. So we need, based on our assumptions so far, we need that if you take the inner product of n with the jth correction to the state n, that's what psi nj is, that has to be zero for all j, except j equals zero. So it has to be true for all j equals one, two, three, et cetera. Okay, and this is gonna be very useful. It follows from the previous boxed equation. We just use the rules of inner products to get it from the previous boxed equation. And so actually I'll put a little red asterisk by this. And I'll remind you every time we use that and then we'll see why this was a very useful assumption to make rather than assuming psi sub n was orthonormal to assume that it satisfied the boxed equation up here. Okay. All right, so now let's go ahead and do perturbation theory. And we're gonna do perturbation theory by now writing down the Schrodinger equation. which is gonna be a little bit of a, a mess. So we start with the complete Hamiltonian, which is H zero plus Lambda W. I'm sorry, professor. Yes. Let's just scroll up a little bit. I'm, I was still writing some stuff. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we have H zero plus Lambda W. And now we're gonna plug in our state psi sub N, which is N plus lambda psi sub n1 plus lambda squared psi sub n2 plus dot dot dot. Okay, that's the Hamiltonian acting on the state. And then on the other side of the equation, it's the energy eigenvalue, which is curly E n plus lambda E n1 plus lambda squared E n two plus dot 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 multiplied again by the state. So n plus lambda psi n one. I'm just repeating what's on the line above. Okay, and so that's the that's the time independent Schrodinger equation the eigenvalue problem for our unperturbed state. So it's kind of a big mess. It involves not only an infinite sum over lambda here, but a product of two infinite sums over lambda. And now the idea is just to, to multiply everything out and look at powers of lambda. Okay, so expand both sides and then match powers of lambda. Okay, so first we'll just do the first few powers of lambda and then we'll write down what the answer is for a general power of lambda. So the lowest power of lambda is just lambda to the zeroth power. Okay, and since I'm only including positive power or non-negative powers of lambda, all I need to do there is look at what doesn't depend on lambda. And so I've got H zero times N on the left side. And on the right side, I have curly E sub N and N. And so that's going to amount to just saying H zero acting on N equals curly E sub N acting on N which is just what we assumed we already knew. 
So that's not actually telling us anything except that we are in, in fact doing things correctly. Okay, but now lambda to the first power is gonna give us something more interesting. Okay, so we just have to look at every term that has lambda to the first power. So we have H zero times lambda psi N one, and we have W acting on N. So let's write down those terms. H zero psi N one plus W acting on the unperturbed state N. That's the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, we've got um, curly E acting on this one has a lambda in it. And then we've got E N one acting on N. So let's write down those terms. So we've got curly E N psi N one plus E N one acting on N. Okay, so that's a non-trivial equation. It's not automatically true like the previous equation. Let's do lambda squared before we solve these. So lambda squared is gonna have an H zero acting on psi N two. And then it's gonna have a W acting on psi N one. All of these kets are things that we're going to try to solve for. Okay, and on the right, that's it for the left hand side for things that have lambda squared in them. And then on the right hand side, we've got curly EN psi N2 plus EN1 psi N1. And we've got EN2. Psi n zero, which I can write just as n. So let me just write n here. Okay, and now we can continue doing this. Let's try to figure out what the general form is when we match the power on both sides of lambda to the k. Okay, so on the left hand side, we'll have H zero acting on psi n k. And we'll also have W acting on psi n k minus one. So that's just because the W comes with a lambda. So if we're counting powers of lambda to the k, we, need, we have to have one less power of lambda on the psi part of it. And then on the right-hand side, we're gonna have Early E sub N psi N K. And then we're gonna have a whole bunch of terms that's gonna be written as a sum, J equals one up to K, E N J times psi N K minus J. Okay, and of course this keeps going on forever, but that's the general, the general uh, expression that we have to solve. So we have to solve all these equations simultaneously for the EN superscripts and the psi N superscripts. Okay, and we're gonna do it up to some power. So solve up to some power. And for almost all problems, it's k equals one or maybe k equals two is all you have to worry about. Okay, you okay. worry about the others, but mostly just because you're hoping that they're not large enough to ruin everything. Professor? Yeah. Is that an N at, at the end of the line with lambda two? That is an N, yes. Thank we'll you. Rewrite it. That one. Good. Okay. So we're going to solve these up to some power lambda k. We've already solved lambda zero because that was trivial. And so now let's do the lambda one equation. So we're going to 
take the inner product of the lambda one equation with a bra that's n. Okay, and that will tell us something interesting, hopefully. So what do we get? We get n h zero psi n one plus n perturbation Hamiltonian, which is w n equals curly e sub n n psi n one plus e n one inner product n within. All right, so now what can we do with this? Fortunately, some of these terms, it turns out, are going to be zero. So for example, this one, that one is zero because of what I called the red asterisk formula below or, or above. Okay, so that's zero. And if we look at the first term, the nice thing about taking an inner product with n is then we can replace the h zero by curly e. And then once we've replaced the h zero by curly e, then the n is right next to the psi n one again. And so that's gonna make that be zero as well. Again, by our red asterisk formula. Okay, and so in fact, that term and that term just disappear. Okay, and so we've learned what en1 is. En1 is nothing other than the inner, the matrix element of the perturbation Hamiltonian between the states n and n, or between the same, between the state n itself. Okay, so that's the simplest result from first order perturbation theory. What does this say? In words, it says to first order in uh, perturbation theory, the energy shift, remember EN1 was how much the perturbed energy differed from the unperturbed energy. That energy shift is equal to the expectation value of the Hamiltonian perturbation. Well, that's what W was. So a lot of times that's all you really care about. You all, all you wanna know is how much does the energy shift of the state I'm talking about, okay? But another way of writing that is the complete energy is the energy for H zero plus N W N plus higher order terms that are hopefully small and turn out, for example, when we do the fine structure of the hydrogen atom and they are indeed small. Okay, so we found the first order correction to the energy, but maybe we also want the first order correction to the weight to the state. So what about psi n first order correction? Okay, well, we're gonna use completeness. So completeness says the following, that that state or that, yeah, that state psi n1 is equal to a sum over all states that are eigenstates of H zero. Okay, so the idea is we organize everything in terms of H zero eigenstates because those are what we know. All right, and so I've just written completeness here because I've written the identity operator in a fancy way. And now I'm gonna rewrite this slightly as sum over M not equal to N, M, M, psi n1. Okay, and why was I allowed to do that? 
that's again the red asterisk formula because when I wrote m not equal to n, I was leaving out one term, but the one term I was leaving out was zero anyway, because that's the inner product n with psi n of one. That's what that red asterisk formula told us was zero. Okay, so all every time we do one of these things where we use the red asterisk formula, we're getting dividends from our uh, apparently strange choice of normalization but it's really uh, important that it works out that way. So now the idea is we need to find these things. Oops. So we need to find those inner products. And then if we have them, we will be done with finding the state because then we can just plug into this formula and we will have the perturbed state psi n1 in terms of the unperturbed state. Okay, so how are we going to do that? We're going to go back to our lambda to the one equation. And we're going to take the inner product of that with the state m with the bra in. So that with the lambda to the first power equation. Okay, and we're only going to do it for m not equal to n because that's what this is telling us. We only need it for m not equal to n. Okay, so let's write that down. Uh, that is equal to m h zero psi n1 plus m w n. Okay, on the left side and on the right side of that equation, the lambda of the one equation, it's curly E sub n m psi n of one plus E n one m n. All right, so now fortunately, some of these things are zero again. Okay, this thing is the easiest thing that's zero, just because we assumed our ortho they were orthonormal states of the H0 Hamiltonian, so that's zero. And then this here, we can do the same trick we did before and say that is equal to curly E sub M times m. And now that is going to give us, let me go back to black ink again. Okay, so that's going to give us curly E sub m, m psi n1. And so we notice that what we've got here is two copies of that, one on each side of the equation. Let's bring them together and then we'll be able to solve for them. Okay, and so if we do that, we get m psi n1 is equal to one over the difference in the curly E energies times the matrix element mwn. Okay, and that's what up here we said we needed to find. So we've done it. Notice that we've done it only for m not equal to n because if m if m equals n, this thing will blow up and that's a disaster. In fact, not only that, but if we have a degeneracy in the unperturbed energies, then the denominator will also blow up. En minus em will be zero and that will be a disaster. Okay, and so that's where we're gonna, when we do degenerate perturbation theory, that's where we're gonna have to think about how to avoid that problem. Okay, but the reason we didn't have a problem here is because we were able to avoid m equaling n. And the only reason we were able to avoid that is because of this convention choice that we made uh, earlier on that I claimed was going to be so great. This explains why it's so great. It avoids a disaster now. It would have been, this would have been a disaster if we had a zero, de zero denominator. Okay, let me pause and see if there are any questions so far. 
Could you briefly uh, mention that con the convention choice again? Please? Yeah, let's go back up there because it's okay. So the the root of the convention choice that looked a little bit weird when we first did it was this. Okay, instead of saying psi n psi n was one, we chose to make the unperturbed state and the perturbed state, we chose to make their inner product one. Then we did a little bit of algebra and that gave us this. At that point, it was maybe a little mysterious. Why are we making this choice? That's why I called it the red asterisk formula to remind you. And now we go through a bunch of algebra and we find out that this is why it was such a great choice. Here, we avoided having to include the m equals n term in the sum, which was a really good thing because then we avoid having a zero denominator. Okay, so that was, it's, it's hard to see these things in advance maybe, but now that we've gotten there, we realize it would have been a disaster if we hadn't made that choice because of this. It's still possible to do perturbation theory, but uh, it, gets, it gets more difficult. I think that helped. Sure. And one of the reasons I'm making a big deal out of this is when we go ahead and do degenerate perturbation theory, we're going to choose, we're going to do something very similar. And if we realize what the root of the problem is that's causing this possible denominator to blow up, it's going to make things very easy to see how to solve the problem. Okay, we're, for now we're assuming things are not degenerate at all, no degeneracies in energy. And that means we've solved the problem to first order in lambda. We have both the energy and the state to order lambda to the first power. And now you can just continue indefinitely. We're not gonna be able to continue indefinitely today, partly because indefinitely means infinitely, but let's just write down the next thing that we should do and then we'll carry it out next time. Okay, let's say we just look at the order lambda k equation. Okay, and now I'm gonna take the inner product with the bra n. So we're getting some information out of that equation, but not all of it. We'll return later to what all of the information means. Okay, so if we just write down though, what we get, we get n h zero psi n k plus n perturbation Hamiltonian w psi n k minus one on the left side of the equation. And the right side of the equation, you can write like this. It's a sum from j equals zero up to k of e n j n psi n k minus j. Okay, so now on the left side, we get to use our red asterisk again. We do the exact same trick that we've been doing. We pull out h zero acting on n is curly n, curly e sub n. So we write it like that. And then this is the thing that our red asterisk equation told us was equal to zero. So once again, our red asterisk equation is being really nice to us and getting rid of ugly terms. And on the right hand side, actually the same thing is going to happen. Okay, for every term except j equals k, this equals zero. So for all except j equals k, that's our red asterisk equation again in action. And so that's great because that means in that infinite sum, there's only one term. Okay, and so we can ignore the first term on the left. We only get one term on the right. And so what have we got? We've got the nth order correction to the energy, or sorry, the kth order correction to the energy E sub n is equal to the matrix element n 
W psi sub n k minus one. Okay, so what is that equation telling us? That's telling us that if we have the wave function at order k minus one, then we get the energy at order k. So the energy always depends on knowing the wave function at one less order. Okay, so we need wave function at order k minus one on the right side to get the energy correction at order k. So another way of saying that is we've boiled everything down to just finding the corrections to the wave function, because if we've got those, then we automatically get the next order correction in energy. And it's just a matter of working out this matrix element in the last boxed equation. OK, so next time we will go ahead and do that and probably get to use our red asterisk formula even more times. Um, and then we'll have a general expression at least to order lambda squared for the perturbations to the energy and the states, uh, assuming that the, that the series actually converges. Okay, and then we'll get to do a bunch of examples. The, this uh, type of problem, of course, is a favorite for the PhD candidacy exam. Uh, people love to give problems in first order perturbation theory, especially testing that you know this particular formula and know how to use it. And then sometimes if the people writing the test are in a bad mood, uh, seeing if you can expand it to beyond that order or seeing if you can apply this formula right here in the case of degeneracies, which when we get to it, I'll explain to you is not hard at all. Okay, that's it for today. And Monday is a holiday. So I will see you all on Wednesday with uh, hopefully homeworks. All right, any, any questions on today's lecture before I stop the recording?